Okay. So welcome everybody again. And after this excellent warm up, let me introduce our second speak, main speaker of this today's seminar. He is Adam Benderbruger. And let me read out uh, his titles, Adam, Adam's titles. So he's a global network professor of uh, New York University, affiliated faculty member and NYU Shanghai, distinguished professor, Tanner School of Engineering, and GP Wells professor, Stern School of Business, New York University. And we know him because of uh, some classical papers like the epistemic characterization of Nash equilibrium and other with Paul Bowman, other papers with Tekel and others which are very important in game theory. But what it is, um, is, is somehow hidden in his uh, CV that he, let me say, Adam, that you have a double life somehow because you are also very interested in non-classical things. And this non-classical things like examining quantum or non-signaling structures. And today uh, we will learn from you about these things because I mean these non-classical things, because today we Adam Brenner will speak about agreement and disagreement in a non-classical world. So thank you for coming, Adam. Thank you, Miklos and, and everybody. And the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, organizers. Thank you, Miklos. Um, yeah, I have found that um, there's some uh, safety in having more than one appointment at a university. Highly recommended strategy. Um, so great to be here, or almost here, as they say on Zoom. Um, let me share my screen. Give me one second. I'm going to try the fancy method. Let's see if it works. Okay. Um, are you seeing me full screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Great to be here. Um, so uh, this is also a very exploratory talk. Um, work with my co-authors, Patricia contreras Tejada, Pierre Francesca Lamora, Giannicola Scola, and Kai Stevenson. And um, let me start in a very classical space um, with a reminder of the classical agreement theorem um, due to Robert Alman familiar to everybody, I'm confident, um, but let me just quickly state it so that we know what we're going to be uh, doing later. Um, so we consider our two agents, Alice and Bob, starting with a common prior. They receive typically different private information about the true state. They form their conditional or, if you like, posterior probabilities of some common underlying event of interest. And uh, Alman's very famous theorem states that if these two values for the posteriors are common knowledge between our two agents, um, they must be equal. And here, by common knowledge, we mean uh, the usual thing, that both agents uh, know an event, uh, both know that they know it, and so on indefinitely. Um, so this is a theorem, of course, but I think it's also interesting to think of it as a potential kind of consistency requirement in the sense, as I say on this slide, that it has implications for trade and equilibrium, as noted here, that you might think of as in some sense necessary for a theory, perhaps I mean by that a normative theory to yield. Um, so I've talked here about uh, three such uh, desiderata, if you like, of a classical, perhaps even normative theory, uh, all famous results due to uh, Sabinius and Gina Coplis concerning betting between risk neutral agents, uh, a famous theorem by Morgan von Stokey, and then an application to game theory. Um, I'm confident this is review for everybody. I just want to emphasize this idea of 
agreement uh, being something that we might impose as a requirement on the system um, later on. So we'll come back to that idea. Okay, so the next slide, probably pretty much all of you have seen. Um, this is just a reminder that when we say common knowledge in the agreement theorem, we really mean common knowledge. We don't mean high order mutual knowledge. Um, this point was really first made in a classic paper by Gina Coplas and Paula Makakis in 1982. Um, this is a, a simplified later example, um, courtesy of John Gina Coplas. So I'm slightly changing the rules here relative to the talk in that we have a countable state space. You can see it forms this kind of staircase that goes down to the lower right. The prior probabilities are indicated. Um, Alice observes the rows, Bob observes the columns, and the event of interest is the yellow stripe, the, the states um, that uh, are sitting inside the yellow stripe. And so you can see Alice's conditional probabilities, regardless of what information she might get, are always two thirds. And for Bob, his conditional probabilities are always one third, um, excepting if he were to receive information equal to the first column, in which case he would put conditional probability one on the event of interest. So now I'm sure you know the trick. What we do is we take the true state to be a long way down the staircase, somewhere to the Southeast, and depending upon how far down we go, um, we will have an epistemic state in which there is high order mutual knowledge that Alice's posterior is two thirds and Bob's is one third. In other words, high order mutual knowledge that the two agents disagree. Um, we won't have common knowledge because in uh, checking whether or not common knowledge obtains, we will eventually hit Bob's first column. Um, and there we have a conditional probability of one um, rather than one third. Um, so this is a, a, a nice clean example just to remind us that what we mean um, is truly the full force of common knowledge in the agreement theorem. Um, excellent. So as Miklos said, my talk is going to be about non-classical settings. Um, let me talk about two reasons to depart from the classical setting. Um, one is a little bit of physics, but I emphasize this will not be a physics talk. We'll do a little, very simple self-contained exercise along those lines in a minute. Um, and the other is going to be, uh, I put it out there up front, um, distinctly speculative in terms of what a new decision theory might look like. So starting with the physical domain, um, uh, it is uh, fully established that in the world of quantum phenomena, um, classical probabilities cannot be used to model the outcomes of all experiments. For those of you who know what this means, this is a, a, a statement, a loose statement of a very fundamental and famous result called Bell's theorem from quantum mechanics um, with some associated jargon here. We'll take a look at an example. It's actually very simple to do the algebra in a moment just to reinforce that point. That'll be our one foray into a little bit of physics. And we will get a clear sense of why the classical Bayesian model of probabilities does not apply there. Um, in decision theory, more speculative, as I said, um, my point of departure here is really non-classical alternatives to conventional decision theory um, that have grown up in a couple of related literatures, some in economic theory, some in mathematical psychology. Um, and what's done here is that the formalism, let me emphasize that word, the formalism of quantum mechanics is used to build non-classical decision theories. So um, we pick up the math of quantum and we uh, equip our decision makers with certain non-classical procedures. And the motivation for doing this um, is, as shown in some of these papers, that these offer potential resolutions of some of our well-known anomalies in choice. 
Now, obviously, there are many other non-classical decision theories, um, some already alluded to in the previous talk by Stefan. Um, the reason I look at this set of work, a little less well-known to economists, is because um, it suggests an alternative, um, which is, might there be an interesting non-classical decision theory which permits the introduction of signed, i.e., negative probabilities. And um, this would not commit us to the specific quantum formalism, um, which I think has advantages, since that was developed for a very different purpose, physics, not decision theory. Um, in a precise sense, I'll make clear on a slide to come, uh, working with signed probabilities encompasses quantum math while making fewer commitments. Um, so uh, I'm just proposing, um, without having worked it out, that there might be an interesting non-classical decision theory that admits a judicious presence for negative probabilities. Now, something really important to emphasize right away is anytime one mentions negative probabilities, we have to be very clear that um, we are going to mean that all observable events get non-negative probabilities. Um, in the physics setting, this is a must because the observable events are literally frequencies collected in the lab. Um, in the case of a non-classical decision theory, um, I guess the argument isn't quite as tight. Uh, perhaps an extreme subjectivist would allow for negative probabilities to be attached to some observable but non-repeatable event, um, but I'm not going to go in that direction. So we will have observability requirements that everything um, that can indeed be observed receive non-negative um, probability. Um, okay, so two motivations. One is uh, you know rock solid and 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 firmly established, which is um, the need to go beyond the classical Bayesian model in describing certain quantum phenomena. I'm going to give you a, a, a little glimpse of that in the next couple of slides, if, in case it's not familiar. Um, it's very simple to do. Um, and then the second, which I fully admit is not well worked out, is could there be an interesting non-classical decision theory with signed probabilities? And in that respect, what I'm doing in this talk is a little preliminary investigation of what the world of, of agents like Alice and Bob with signed probabilities might look like. Okay, so a very little piece of the physics, um, and I'm going to uh, not talk any serious physics, I'm just gonna talk about the math that emerges. Um, so think about um, the, top, the top table here. Um, we have a pair of subatomic particles. They're prepared in a particular, what's called entangled fashion. One is sent off to Alice in some location and the other to Bob in another location. Alice can perform one, uh, either of, of two measurements, uh, A or A prime on her particle. Um, these of course have specific physical meanings. Um, Bob can perform one or two measurements, B or B prime. Uh, every measurement conducted either by Alice or Bob um, has one of two possible outcomes, zero or one. And so we can collect all this together and we'll get a table like the top table where the way you should read it is that the, uh, I've written them deliberately as F to indicate the experimental frequentist setup, the frequencies that we collect um, sum to one on each row. Okay, so we have four probability measures there summing to one across each row. Um, and this is something we can collect in the lab. And a very famous uh, particular case of that, fully realizable with uh, a quantum physical setup, is the so called Bell model at the bottom. And you can see there that indeed, as required, the probabilities across each row sum to one. So you might say that's all very well and good. What's non-classical about this? Well, the non-classicality comes in when we ask the question, 
can we derive these empirical probabilities, as shown on this slide, from some underlying state space formulation? So I've repeated the empirical model on the left-hand side here. And on the right-hand side, I have something that's um, very familiar to us as uh, economic theorists or game theorists. Um, in physics, it's called a phase space representation. Um, it is an enumeration of 16 states where each state is a complete description of how the system would react to, to, to any of the possible measurements that could be conducted on it. Okay, so we've got rho uh, labeled by P0, which ha happens to say that regardless of what measurement Alice or Bob conducts, um, the outcomes will be zero. And we can read the um, rows P1, P2, P3, etc. cetera, um, similarly. And um, um, we put probabilities P0 through P15 on each of these 16 states um, in such a way that we plan to um, reproduce or induce, if you like, the observed probabilities. So example, I just highlighted one case here. Um, F7 is the frequency, the observed probability uh, of the outcome 0, 1, when Alice chooses A prime and Bob chooses B. And if we look across to the state space formulation on the right, and you look at the columns A prime and B, um, you will see that there are four states, namely the ones labeled with P2, P3, P10, and P11, that in, induce those uh, responses to measurement. So in particular, we would require that P2 plus P3 plus P10 plus P11 equal F7. Um, in case you're wondering, um, I'm certainly not saying that there's a unique uh, phase space representation. Um, uh, it's going to be enough for us to ask whether, in fact, um, there is such a representation. Um, and the fame of Bell's theorem is that there may not be. So if we go back quickly to the bottom table here, you'll see a number of entries with halves and three eighths and eighths and zeros. And I'm not going to go through it literally step by step, but by picking off judiciously four entries from the Bell empirical model, one of the halves and three of the eighths, and then requiring the phase space model we just saw to induce those probabilities, um, you, can, you can check, you will get these four equations that I show. Okay, so that's just like the example I gave, only I picked very carefully for specific empirical models, uh, probabilities in the Bell model. So what we then do is um, add the second, third, and fourth equations to give the long display indicated. And then we see we've run into a contradiction because on the left-hand side, we have P0, P1, P4, and P5, along with other probabilities, um, but those probabilities on the left-hand side already sum to a half, which is greater than the three-eighths on the right-hand side. So this is a very simple calculation based on the Bell model and trying to induce it from a state space model. Um, you might also say, perhaps my little uh, argument here um, gives a little hint if I allow myself to introduce negative probabilities in the phase space representation, remember that never means observable, in the unobservable probabilities, maybe I can make these equations um, satisfied. Uh, and I'll give you a general answer. The answer is yes. And I'll give you a general answer to that in just a moment. Um, OK, so um, I can't resist. Uh, um, sorry, let me just go back one second. Um, I wanted to mention one more thing at the bottom of the slide, what I just alluded to. Um, so you might ask, what is the full scope of introducing negative probabilities on phase space? 
on our underlying state space. And um, there are various theorems in that respect of varying generality. I'm quoting one here with a colleague, Samson Abramsky. It's quite a lot more general than the setup I've actually shown you. And the answer is um, introducing signed probabilities on face space um, precisely allows us to represent all empirical models. Remember the empirical models are just these, these pictures um, that satisfy a particular condition called no signaling. Um, I will say briefly what no signaling is. It's very simple, but I'm not going to go into detail on the theorem. No signaling says if we're looking at an empirical model and we fix Alice's choice of measurement, so she's choosing A, say, the marginal on her outcome, so the marginal probability on her seeing zero or one, is not affected by Bob's choice of measurement, not affected by whether Bob chooses B or B prime, and vice versa. And uh, fact, um, the set of so-called no signaling models strictly includes the, the models such as the Bell model that are realizable in quantum systems. So um, the answer is um, the introduction of sign probabilities allows us to capture all, but actually more than all, um, quantum systems of the type we've been looking at. Okay, I'm going to get momentarily to our setup with signed probabilities and some epistemics with signed probabilities. Um, so that's essentially the end of the physics motivation. I couldn't resist one more slide, but um, I'm not going to spend time on it. But suffice it to say that some of the greatest names in quantum physics um, were advocates of the use of negative probabilities, at least in the sense that we've been describing. Okay, so let's, um, as it were, kind of uh, go back to the beginning in a sense, something we're very familiar with, with one change. So we're gonna look at an abstract state space omega, Alice and Bob will have partitions PA and PB of omega representing their private information. And there will be a common prior uh, with the possibility that this common prior is a signed probability measure on omega. Um, I already made quite a, a deal about observability and that's very important. Um, so from here on, we will assume that all members of the partitions receive a uh, non-negative, actually strictly positive probability between zero and one. Um, and any event of interest that we mention, as in statements of uh, agreement theorems, will also receive such probability. So that will put a little discipline on what we're able to do. Let's do a warm-up example um, to see what might be different about epistemic with signed versus unsigned probability. Um, so the picture represents our state space. Um, we've got these four points. The prior probabilities are shown. Evidently, there's a negative probability on one state, omega-3. Um, Alice's partition is in red and Bob's is in blue. Um, our observability conditions are satisfied. Well, for that, I should also add the event of interest is going to be omega one, omega three, omega four, and the true state will be omega one. So um, let's, let's calculate some first and second order beliefs. So at omega one, um, what is Alice's conditional probability of E? Um, so uh, we can just follow the usual formula um, and form her probability of omega one um, intersection E um, divided by her probability of omega one. Of course, that's going to be one. Alice assigns probability one to E. Um, what about Bob? Well, at omega one, he has that blue oval. Um, the conditional probability that he assigns to the event E, which is omega one, omega three, omega four. You can see that in the uh, 
uh, um, intersection of E with his um, partition element, uh, we get the states omega one and omega three, uh, and those sum to zero. Um, He's conditioning on his partition cell, which is well-defined and positive. So his conditional probability of E is zero. Um, okay, nothing so far is non-classical. All of that could have happened in a classical setting. Um, but let's go one more step. What's the event um, that Bob does assign probability zero to E? Well, we've just seen it consists of his first partition element, um, the blue oval, omega one, omega two, omega three. Um, at omega four, uh, he does he assigns, in fact, probability one to e. So omega four is not included. So I've used the notation g. G is the event that Bob assigns probability zero to e. And now a key step: what is the probability that Alice assigns? to Bob's assigning probability zero to E. In other words, to Alice's assigning probability one to G. Um, well, G is omega one, omega two, omega three. Um, and the intersection of that with omega one is again, omega one. In other words, Alice assigns conditional probability one to the event G. So let me put that in plain words. At omega one, let's focus on Alice. She assigns probability one to E. She also assigns probability one to the event that Bob assigns probability zero to E. Um, let me first give this a, a label, which I kind of like. Let's call this singular disagreement, um, uh, sort of a riff on uh, mu mutual singularity in probability theory. And then let me leave as a homework exercise that if our prior was non-negative in the usual way, um, it would be impossible to bring about this epistemic state. Okay, um, so just to reinforce, it's not of course that Alice and Bob disagree, it's, it's about the beliefs of Alice. It's that she simultaneously assigns probability one to an event and probability one to the event that the other agent assigns probability zero to that event. So that is um, non-classical, so I'm claiming. Um, and um, of course, we want to go beyond this. We want to talk about agreement theorems in a non-classical world. So let me um, introduce um, what we need to do that. Um, so we need to move to higher order beliefs. And at the same time, I'm going to make um, a switch of modality relative to the classical agreement theorem. And I'm gonna make a switch from knowledge to certainty. So the distinction is there at the top of the slide. Um, this could be a, uh, an entire talk in its own right. Um, uh, this is, uh, some people say not too big a distinction in the classical world between these two modalities. Um, those of us who uh, engage in epistemic game theory tend to have strong feelings about the choice of modality here. Um, and uh, uh, at least two of us in this seminar, since I saw Pierre Paolo is here, I think would argue strongly for a belief-based modality. Um, but I really can't get into that. The main point at the moment is we're going to see that it really matters in a non-classical setting in a non-classical probabilistic setting, what modality we choose. And I am going to argue that the more meaningful one is the certainty modality, um, uh, but I'll explain the difference as I go. Um, okay, so we know the difference between knowledge and certainty at the top of the slide. Um, using certainty, um, we can define in the obvious and familiar way uh, what it means to say that it is common certainty at a state omega star that Alice assigns probability QA to E and Bob assigns probability QB to E. Um, and um, uh, that uh, is going to be a definition we're going to um, make uh, use of momentarily. Um, so um, a little more on the relationship. Um, 
So um, a little thought, I even wrote a little proof out in the slide here, tells you that common knowledge is a stronger epistemic condition than common certainty. Um, as I said already, uh, sometimes people don't make a big deal of this distinction in the classical domain, although some of us do. Um, crucially, since, as I said, I am going to explore common certainty, we need to establish the classical baseline. Um, so there is a classical agreement theorem with common certainty. I'm sure many of you have written it out for your own benefit at times. It's actually a beautiful little argument. It's a little different from the uh, knowledge-based proof. Um, but just so we know the baseline, um, uh, agreement holds equally with common certainty um, as it does with common knowledge. So we're pretty much ready now to say what's going to happen if we take these ideas to the non-classical domain. Um, and I'm going to be looking at common certainty in detail. Um, but I should tell you what happens if we were to continue to use common knowledge in the presence of signed probabilities. So if we were to do that, which is not where I'm going, this is an aside, um, we would actually get an analog to uh, a non-classical analog to the classical agreement theorem. Um, it turns out that you can just rerun, as I indicate here, the uh, argument for Alman's original theorem. Um, I'm hoping I'm talking to the uh, uh, people who are kind of in on this. Um, the essential idea, of course, is that Alice's posterior has to be constant on the different members of her partition that make up the member of the meat that contains the true state. And you then take a convex combination, which is therefore the same amount, the same quantity. Well, if you have a signed measure, you take an affine combination. So nothing changes. Um, now, I mentioned this theorem with half of you to not including it, because I don't think it's really the right theorem in the non-classical case. Um, first of all, it doesn't even need observability, which I think is a little bit of a hint that it's not really doing what we're talking about. And secondly, there's no interaction between, you know, uh, knowledge and signed measures. And I think the modality of how our agents think should be reflective of the probability system that they're using, the probability theory that they're using. Um, so I mentioned this for thoroughness. Um, but where I really want to go is this slide, which is um, for, for, for my co-authors and myself, the very exciting, the exciting slide. Um, so here is an example um, where we claim um, with a signed probability measure, a signed prior, with all our observability conditions satisfied, you nevertheless can have common certainty of disagreement. So this is obviously a very sharp break from the classical case. So let me try to um, argue it through. Um, obviously, I'm not going to write down the formal induction, but I think I can give you the idea of the proof. Um, okay, so a couple of comments. The event of interest is omega 2, omega 4, omega 5, omega 6. So it's kind of the states in the middle there. The true state is omega 5. We think of epsilon and eta as kind of small enough, as it'll be clear what that means, and unequal. Okay, so let's. Let's start calculating. So at omega five, what's Alice's conditional probability to E? Um, okay, so for that, we look at um, uh, the conditional probability formula. And she's going to have a calculation that has um, a half minus epsilon in the numerator and um, a half in the denominator, right? Um, a total probability of her red um, uh, partition cell here, omega 1, omega 2, omega 5 is a half, and she assigns probability a half um, minus epsilon um, to, to 
to the intersection of that with E. Um, so that comes out to one minus two epsilon. So just to repeat at omega five, Alice assigns conditional probability one minus two epsilon to E. And symmetrically at omega five, Bob assigns conditional probability one minus two eta to E. Okay, key step at omega five, um, Alice assigns what probability to um, Bob's partition cell, the, the blue oval, the one we were just looking at, um, omega-3, omega-4, omega-5. And the answer is um, she assigns probability one to that because she assigns probability a half to the intersection divided by a half, which is the total probability she assigns to her cell. Um, so Alice assigns probability one to that cell for Bob, and therefore probability one to Bob's assigning probability one minus two eta to E. Um, what about Bob's other cell, omega one, omega two, omega six? She assigns probability zero, um, uh, uh, conditional probability zero to that cell, and therefore zero to what Bob's probability of E would be in that case it would actually be one minus two epsilon. I have just said, to sum up, that Alice is certain that Bob assigns probability one minus two eta to E. So we've made one step in the induction. Similarly, we can flip it around. You can see the symmetry of the diagram. Bob, this is all at omega five, is certain that Alice assigns probability one minus two epsilon to E. And fingers crossed, you can see that if we wrote this out, the induction will just continue with no change. And we conclude that at omega five, it is common certainty that Alice assigns probability one minus two epsilon to E and Bob assigns probably one minus two eta to E. And choosing epsilon and eta, smallish and different, we conclude that at omega five, there is common certainty of disagreement. Um, so this is a really striking distinction from the classical world. Um, I think it's uh, potentially um, a very positive finding in a certain way I'll describe. Um, but I first want to say we could push this story a little further. Um, there's a rather subtle point here, which I haven't mentioned yet, involving communication between the agents. So let me repeat this, the, the example, same example, uh, same event of interest, but let me imagine just for the sake of it, that the true state was omega one. And now let's do something we're familiar with from the classical setup, which is have the agents go through some kind of announcement process exactly in the style of Gina Coppola's and Barley Makakis, 1982. As you remember, Almond's theorem, Almond's paper is what you might call, I'm not sure if it's a good use of the word, a static setting. It posits a state of common knowledge and asks what follows. Uh, Gina Coppola's and Barley Makakis have the players announce their posteriors infer what information they can from those announcements, update their partitions, and the process continues. Um, and uh, what they show is that um, the announcements must eventually converge. Um, if you scratch your head a little bit, you realize that the uh, partition induced by the pair of announcement is then a common coarsening of each player's partition at that point, therefore is common knowledge, therefore is equal. Um, I know I'm digressing, I can't help it. Um, it's really a beautiful idea because of course it extends immediately to the infinite case because you use martingale convergence to get the um, convergence of the posteriors. And then you, uh, at that point, have again the, the common coarsening um, of the individual player's sigma fields and you reach a kind of uh, Almond theorem for the infinite case. Um, so it was a really significant step by Gina Coppus and Polymakakis. I'm just going to take a baby step here. Um, okay, the true state is omega one. 
Um, we, uh, we said it was omega-5, but that obviously doesn't change Alice's probability that she assigns to the event of interest E because it's the same partition cell. So she announces one minus two epsilon to Bob. Um, Bob is sitting there with the uh, blue, uh, you know, squished oval, omega-1, omega-2, omega-6. Omega um, so he infers from Alice's announcement that the true state actually is omega-1 or omega-2. So then he tries to form a new posterior probability of E. Um, and now we run into some trouble because that would be the quantity minus epsilon, right? The state E2 divided by the probability of E1, E2, which is zero. So we have something distinctly not well-defined, minus epsilon over zero. So here's the next step that um, we, we took in this analysis, coming right up. Um, what's missing? So arguably what's missing is that we should insist that in a situation, all statements that an agent can make about their beliefs, including their higher order beliefs, are in some sense ones that can be processed in a well-defined way by the other agent. Um, arguably, this is some kind of implement implementability condition on the whole structure. Um, let me show you the idea and the theorem this leads to. Um, but I am uh, not yet at least ready to say that we should discard the previous example. I think the previous example of common certainty of disagreement in the non-classical setting is, is, is significant and may have implications. Um, what I'm showing you now is one direction in which you can undo that example, in which you can actually restore the classical theorem. Um, so what we do is really what I just said, takes a little thought mathematically. So for Alice, we're going to define a sequence of partitions. Here they are, uh, calligraphic M, uh, N sub A. Um, each corresponding to a level of announcement that she makes. So you have to think back a little bit, bear with me. Um, the first of her partitions um, consists of A0 and A0 complement. And I hope you remember that the A0 set was the set where uh, we define, were defining common certainty for Alice and Bob. That was the first order set or the zeroth order set, if you prefer, for Alice, simply saying that she assigned probability Q minus A to E. Um, so M zero of A is the partition induced by Alice's zeroth order announcement. Um, the second element, M one sub A for um, Alice, uh, is the partition induced by her announcement that consists of her probability for E, and her certainty that Bob's probability for E is different, namely QB, or is QB, whatever QB might happen to be, and so on for higher order announcements for Alice. Um, these are the partitions induced by each announcement of a, of a certain nth order. Obviously, we have the symmetric partitions for Bob, the partitions induced by the announcements of different order that he could make. Um, one more definition. Um, this definition called regularity ensures that when there is a piece of information announced, pi, um, it can be processed in the usual classical way in terms of uh, how we update what we believe about an event E. Um, in other words, pi receives non-negative probability and um, um, the probability uh, behaves monotonically with respect to um, pi and E as shown. Okay, so here's a definition. We're going to call one of our structures, just like we had basic setup, communication enabled with respect to a particular event 
if um, for each piece of information, a player, let's take Alice, might receive. And notice that pi A lies in the join of her own partition, P A, and some order of belief that Bob announces when he says, I'm certain that you're certain that I'm certain, dot, dot, dot. Um, that piece of information can be processed in a normal fashion. Um, and similarly for Bob. So I know that's a little bit of a mouthful, um, but the idea here is to insist on a meaningful, I think it's really synonymous to say classical uh, way of processing announcements that the players could make, go ahead and actually make about their beliefs of various orders. Um, and it's easily seen that this property fails in the previous example. And now here is a new agreement theorem. Okay, so this is, this is a new theorem with, with, with a new proof. Um, we fix a structure. We could have a signed prior. However, it is what I called communication enabled with respect to E. Um, the announcements the players could make are capable of being processed. We suppose at a particular state, it's common certainty that Alice's probability is QA and Bob's is QB, and we get the classical result that they have to agree. Um, the proof is in a paper which uh, is in process, well, exists in some form, but is being revised, um, and uh, um, involves uh, some distinct new steps um, relative to the, to the classical proof. Um, the theorem is a little subtle in terms of what it's saying. Um, it is, although I motivated it by saying, now imagine the players were to make announcements uh, in, the, in the style of Ginocopoulos and Polymakakis. Um, it's not actually a theorem about successive announcements. It's about whether announcements, if made, could be interpreted in a classical fashion. Um, you can see that because if you go back a moment, um, everything is defined relative to the player's initial partitions. Okay. Uh, we're not actually updating the partitions. I think the right kind of language to put around this is that the structure that we've just looked at that we called communication enabled is one in which the players would have the ability to confirm the epistemic state. Here that state is the common certainty of the posteriors. This in itself is enough to rule out disagreement. We do not say the players actually go through an iterative process uh, of, of sh sharing announcements. Um, so um, it's kind of subtle and um, uh, I think I think we're still kind of uh, getting our heads around uh, how to think about this theorem. Um, um, and as I said, um, I don't want to view it, at least at the moment, as a way of uh, pushing the common certainty of disagreement possibility and example aside. Um, this is, as I hope I warned at the beginning, definitely exploratory work. Um, but I think there's something interesting going on with this theorem. Okay, so let me uh, begin to finish up uh, with some thoughts on possible implications. Um, so first, a nod back to the physics motivation, um, and then some remarks about the possible decision theory implications. Um, okay. So um, this is a headline, um, it's a different talk, but if you go back to the physics domain we were looking at, um, in other work with a slightly different set of co-authors, including Alexander Kubicki, um, we showed that the kind of common certainty of disagreement, CCD, let me call it, um, that we saw in uh, our main example, obviously this is, this here is our main example for the paper. 
um, that kind of common certainty of disagreement uh, is not possible uh, if we are observing quantum systems. Um, it is possible for what in quantum mechanics they call the super quantum systems, which are the same as the no signaling systems I mentioned earlier. In other words, as I said, the introduction of negative probabilities overshoots quantum mechanics. And there's a lot of interest in the area in how you identify the quantum set from within that larger one, a very active axiomatization program. Um, and so in other work, we've shown that the impossibility of common certainty of disagreement um, holds in quantum systems uh, and could therefore potentially be an interesting physical axiom, um, which actually I think makes a lot of sense um, a priori to argue that two observers of a certain physical system, starting with a common prior, which in the physical case is, is very much given by the physics of the system, it's not subjective, um, should not agree to disagree. Um, so that's another work published at the bottom of this, as shown at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so let's go to decision theory. Um, suppose we equip our agents with signed probability measures, absolutely imposing some notion, which I don't have for you. That will be a better talk, which unfortunately is not today's talk, uh, of uh, requiring non-negativity on some suitable notion of observable events. Um, it seems that we could get highly non-classical behavior. Um, we could get, for example, you know, common knowledge that both sides expect to win uh, a, a risk new, uh, a bet between risk neutral agents, you know, um, quite different Sabinius and Gina Coplas. Um, or here's another route. Maybe, and this is what I was alluding to earlier in the talk, we should elevate the impossibility of common certainty of disagreement to some kind of epistemic decision principle. Um, in other words, at least in a multi-agent setting, put some kind of discipline and control on, uh, to put it simply, how negative we allow probabilities to get. Um, and uh, I think that might lead to some very interesting theory. Um, speculation, absolutely. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to mention, a couple of points. Um, first, for thoroughness, and like Stefan, I, I, I have not emphasized a lot of literature in this talk. Um, I did emphasize the quantum-like decision theory, which I'm speculating might be examined maybe more transparently with a signed probability uh, decision theory. Um, there are some papers that are referenced at the top of the slide here that have explored Alman's agreement theorem when you enter a quantum-like realm. Um, let me be very brief here. They're, they're actually quite hard papers for me to understand fully. Um, but um, evidently, they are different from what we are doing here. They allow common certainty of disagreement, even for observers of quantum systems. And I think the answer is that they build in uh, more quantum-like features to how their, their agents actually behave. Um, and then my second point here, with a big thank you to Miklos, who brought this up in an earlier version of this talk that I gave, which I think is super interesting, um, maybe has the answer already, um, was um, maybe we should strengthen or could strengthen the belief modality to something like, I just made the term up, Alice is fully certain of an event if all events in the complement of E receive probability zero. So we're in the sign probability setting, but this is obviously more restrictive than the way I have defined certainty um, in the signed probability setting. Um, and uh, we had a little exchange about this. And uh, I guess my sort of desire would be to explore this route by developing a preference-based definition of full certainty 
In other words, having a, de having a decision theory with sign probabilities, like I keep saying, and then we would come up with some preference-based definition of full certainty, you know, akin to the way we define null events um, through uh, triviality of conditional preferences, um, a la Savage null. Um, so I think there could be some really interesting developments there. And um, maybe it's obvious, maybe it isn't. I haven't tried to think about it. But what would happen to agreement theorems in the non-classical world if uh, we are indeed allowing signed probabilities on unobserved events, but we play with this certainty modality. Uh, in particular, we might tighten it up along these lines that Miklos Shuk, I think, cleverly suggested, and maybe there are other ways too. Um, so I have one more slide. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure having the opportunity to present. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So colleagues, questions, remarks? Yes, I may I ask a question? Of course, I'll try to answer. Yes, so you've stated that um, in the classical realm, uh, there's the no disagreement and that extends fully to the quantum uh, realm. However, you said when we go to the super quantum, then that fails, right? Yes. Does that draw, does that draw a bright line, a tight line between the quantum and the no signaling in other words, is it always the case that if it's a non-quantum or super-quantum non-signaling, then uh, that the disagreement theorem will fail? Um, great question. Um, let me think. Um, so what we showed in the other work is that um, if we go to the super quantum case, so all no, in, in the other jargon, all no signaling models, we exhibit a uh, no signaling, but super quantum, i.e. non-quantum model in which there is common certainty of disagreement. Um, I may be, Maybe I heard in your question whether for any super quantum system, the suitable arrangement of information or something, we can be ass assured of disagreement. That I don't right. know. That was my question. Yes. Uh, op open question, um, not, not answered by the other paper I'm referring to. That was just a possibility result. Um, so that if one wanted to rule out common certainty of disagreement as a kind of physical axiom, and actually I think it's very attractive when you think about physical systems, um, uh, we, um, we know we're restricted to the quantum set, but uh, I don't have a specific answer to your question. Um, good, good question. Thank you. Yeah. I hear we have some young participants. Yeah, in my bedroom, sorry. So. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, yes, in my smallest. Other questions or remarks, colleagues? But I, I mean, I... the whole talk was, of course, uh, a plea, like many talks, I think. I think there's something really interesting to be done in decision theory with signed probabilities. Um, and, um, yeah, I... I if the, I hope to sit back and, and, and read something really interesting on it. Um, but I think that is the direction that this work is, is, is pushing in. Adam, so if we, when you consider a state in your model, yeah. how, do you cons how do you think of it? So, so, I mean, I have in mind the paper by Uman who gives a syntax, so a complete description of the word at each state. Um, can we think about this this state also, or this state is something somehow different in your model? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't thought hard about that because I just, as you saw, we just ported over Almin seventy six structure with the one change of a signed probability measure. So at first blush, I think I want to answer that I think about the states as complete descriptions. Um, 
and uh, I'm not sure that there's any need to reconsider that in the case of signed measures. Um, if we were to think about some kind of big state space, you, you didn't ask this, so I'm sort of cheating, but just to go off on a tangent, if we were to think about some kind of big state space, you know, some, some notion of universal or terminal or complete or something, um, then we'd have a lot of work to do, right? Because we've been operating, we've been operating with signed probability measures versus classical measures. Um, so I think there's a lot that's open here in terms of, you know, what in epistemic game theory, we might call kind of foundations of foundations. Like, you know, we work with types, but underneath that, we know there's a whole theory going back to you know, and Brewster and Berger, Berger and Eisler, and their tendons and near uh, uh, of, what, of how those types uh, come about. Um, and um, I have, it's a, yeah, that's a big door one opens, right? I have not thought hard about that. No, I have not thought about that at all um, in the case of a world where we imagine our agents or players equipped with signed measures. Um, and some in you know some appropriate notion of an observability structure on top on top of that. Yeah, I think that's if people think this is interesting, I think that's one of the things that's that's wide open here. Yeah. And in the, in the case of communication, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> somehow in the classical case, so 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 in, in this model, the interpretation of negative probability is something which you cannot observe. Or in case of communication, you cannot communicate. So you cannot communicate an event if it has positive probability, which is negative. Right. So in this case, you can say that, uh, okay, if the players cannot convince each other, cannot convince each other means that, you know, the convention doesn't hold because of the phenomenon you mentioned, because of the mm -hmm. negativity or the zero in the denominator. Mm -hmm then they can agree to disagree. So somehow it's about the power of convincing each other. So the possibility of, the, of convincing each other this, 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 this thing. Um, so can we interpret this result that, yeah, if the players can convince each other, then the convergence hold. If they cannot because of technical reasons you mentioned, then they can agree. To disagree. That's right. And I just feel I'm not ready yet. Uh, and I speak for my co authors. I'm not ready yet to um, sign on fully to this uh, slide I'm showing here, right, with the, the notion of the communication enabled structure. Um, um, I think I have to think a lot harder about um, a scenario in which there's common certainty of disagreement. Um, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no hole in what I did in, in the previous exam example. It, it it describes subject to buying the idea of assigned measure. It describes, you know, it's a fully described and coherent situation. It merely happens to have the property that if the players set out to what I'm calling, and I'm not sure it's the best word, verifying the situation in which they are in fact in, um, then something falls apart. It's very delicate. Um, maybe I can be allowed, um, although I know we're over time, maybe I can be allowed one very brief throwaway for, for the more physics minded people. Um, I've talked to this to a couple about this with a couple of physicists. It's all very speculative, but um, some of you will know what I'm talking about. You have the double slit experiment. You see the interference pattern. Think of the interference pattern as broadly applicable to common certainty of disagreement, some wildly non-classical phenomenon. If you introduce apparatus into the double slit experiment, that can detect through which slit the electron goes, the pattern disappears. 
And this is not because of some, you know, metaphysical nonsense about I have to be there as a conscious being to observe it and write down the results. It's the mere introduction of the apparatus destroys the interference pattern. Uh, some very broad analogy, I think something like that is happening here. The mere ability to communicate seems to destroy the common certainty of disagreement. But, you know, this is really deep stuff. And, and, and I, I, think I, I think it needs a lot of thought. Um, but this, I, the, right now, you know, the math produces an example like this. I think you can kind of see it's kind of elegant and minimal. And then there is this natural communication question which destroy, destroys the disagreement. And, and that's kind of where I am. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much. So if there are no further questions or remarks, then thank you again, Adam, for the interesting talk. My pleasure. Really and, great to uh, see everyone. Yes.